The key is the word compulsion. The idea of drawing all children, all young people into some universal program administered by the leader or the leaders is as old as Plato, probably older. But nowhere on earth was that able to be imposed until northern Germany, under the military rule of the Prussians, finally imposed that in 1818, so in the first, second decade of the 19th century. That is the first time. It was announced in other places, but never was it able to be successfully administered because the idea is so crazy and so damaging inherently that people simply disobeyed the law. The experience of Prussian Germany was that it was possible to convert sovereign human beings into human resources. That's a translation of a German compound. And that by making these people incomplete, making them unable to think in contexts, but they could be converted into specialist tools for management, scientific management. Horace Mann was hired by the railroad and coal interests of New England to bring about compulsion. He had no interest in schooling. He was an ambitious young politician. He did get compulsion laws passed in 1852. Once it was in Massachusetts, it spread very, very slowly. It wasn't for 15 more years that another state followed suit. So it hardly was a gift of, to the populous portion of America. I smile a little bit when I say that because the mythology is that it was greeted everywhere with great enthusiasm. Not only did parents resist compulsory schooling, they sometimes did so violently. So vehement was the opposition in Barnstable on Cape Cod that state militia were brought in to march children to school under armed guard. A primary reason why the mass of the American population resisted compulsory schooling was a widespread belief that its purpose had little to do with education and everything to do with control. Their suspicions were well-founded. An undercurrent of class warfare runs through early American education documents. The U.S. Bureau of Education Circular of Information for April 1872 explains that inculcating knowledge teaches workers to be able to perceive and calculate their grievances, thus making them more redoubtable foes in labor struggles. Such an enabling is bound to retard the growth of industry. Sixteen years later in the report of the Senate Committee on Education is equally explicit. We believe that education is one of the principal causes of discontent of late years manifesting itself among the laboring classes. The first Red Scare, in my judgment, is the trigger event for the embedment of compulsion schooling in the United States. The uh, Red Scare of 1848 is probably the reason that one American state fell under the compulsion regimen. There are literally thousands of books from the period 1880 to, say, 1920, roughly, that deal with how you scientifically engineer a factory or a church congregation or young people in school. School which followed a general outline of converting kids into obedient tools now took on a very, very mechanistic aspect under this surge of scientific engineering. 
In 1903, the Atlantic Monthly called for adoption of scientific management in schools. Prominent education theorist William C. Bagley stressed a need for unquestioned obedience. The new system would train children for life in 20th century America. Their role to fulfill the needs of commerce, industry, and government. In a community with the best education, more shoppers, more merchandise moving, a higher average of per capita sales. In the other community, fewer shoppers. Maybe things will look up in the long run. In the first community, there's a larger magazine circulation per 1,000 population. A much smaller circulation in the second community, a decline in demand. The student of typing, shorthand, and business machines becomes a producer upon graduation, a tax-developed community asset. He prepares for radio and electronics. His future promises a profit on the taxes invested in him. As education raises the cultural level, so it must also introduce youth to the know-how of production and stir interest in precision, efficiency, and service. With graduation, the community receives a new supply of young people who want a better life on the one hand and who have the ability to work for it on the other. Now the tax investment returns to the taxpayer. In order to aid in the process, the Gary Plan was introduced. It had a new organizational scheme in which different subjects would be taught by different departments. Similar to the breaking down of factory jobs under Taylorism, students would be herded from classroom to classroom in order to digest a stream of standardized factual information. Like Pavlov's dogs, they would do so at the ring of a bell. Children go where The first lesson I saw was the terrible confusion that's in any school as people race about at bell marked intervals, the time honored experience of mental development is that it occurs with strong concentration, not with fragmented attention, class position. You will not find the doctor's son, however ignorant he is, in uh, the class with the marginalized kids. Indifference is wonderful. This is a factory to create indifference to intellectual things, to ideas. They have to be whipped, ordered, and disciplined to do anything. Or, just as bad, they have to be offered bribes to do it. Emotional dependency, sure. Probably half of the 60 million kids who attend school in the United States removed from their own families at a very vulnerable age, become emotionally dependent on a pat on the head, a smile, avoiding an insult. Intellectual dependency, in spite of rhetoric to the contrary, a teacher's nightmare is invested in those kids, if any, who actually have learned how to think for themselves. The teacher's job is not only to convey bits of information that should not be challenged, but also to convey how you connect those bits of information, but not practice in doing that for yourself. You memorize someone else's connection. What is a circle? Billy Henlow. A circle is a closed curve in which all endpoints on the circumference are equally distanced from the center points. Very good. Provisional self-esteem, 
this this really ties into the grades, the test scores, the signs of approval by the teacher. You're allowed to feel good about yourself if an authority issues a signal that you can do that. On the other hand, if the authority condemns you, the only way you can feel good about yourself is to become an outlaw.